Um, so for the next half hour or so, we're going to have our OMAFRA crops panel with our crop specialists. My name is Deb Campbell and I'm an agronomist that uh, works locally here in the area and hopefully you guys have lots of questions to put these guys through their paces. They all look thrilled. Um, but I'll introduce them here. So we have Joanna Fallings on the right. Uh, Joanna is our, our cereal specialist and uh, in the middle we have Ben Rosser, who's our corn lead and on this side we have Megan Moran, so she does dual duty with edible beans and canola. And unfortunately, Jake wasn't able to join us. He's a little under the weather, and uh, we'll give him the day off today, I guess. So, um, so this is totally Q and A, 100%. You guys kicking in some questions. 2017 was a bit of an extreme year, to say the least. <laughs> so hopefully, you guys have some questions, some comments, some things you want to learn about uh, what we can learn from last year and what we could do better. Raise your hand. Laurie's got the mic. So maybe just to start off, warm you guys up a little bit. We'll give these guys a little bit of a, a pre-run. Um, how about each of you just give us, a, give us a challenge within your crop specialty and uh, sort of the outcome from 2017. What was, what was one of the biggest challenges in wheat production, Joanna, that you came across this year? Uh, so one of the big, well, one of the challenges that we came across in wheat this year, uh, similar to last year, was stripe rust. Um, so historically, we haven't had stripe rust in the province. I also apologize. Can everyone hear me at the back? I realize I have a cold and it's... We hear okay? Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yep, thumbs up. Um, so stripe rust for the past two years has been a challenge in Ontario. Um, it has blown in quite early in the season. Um, and as a result, growers who may have historically not applied fungicides early in the season were having to go out and apply uh, fungicides. Um, and so with, with this pest, we are having to use an integrated pest management approach, but um, one of the things we, we do want to um, communicate to growers is that with this disease, we do want to select varieties that are resistant, resistant to this disease, but you also want to select varieties that are still resistant to Fusarium head blight. Um, so you need to be managing both stripe rust and Fusarium head blight. Um, but again, it's something that can be managed with uh, both fungicides and uh, variety selection. Okay, thank you. Ben, what was your biggest challenge in corn? Yeah, so I wouldn't say necessarily big challenge, but maybe um, for growers who weren't used to it in more non-traditional areas would be Western bean cutworm. So it's been fairly well established down the London areas and South London on some of the sands, uh, Norfolk County, uh, Western Middlesex, those kind of areas. But I think in some of the areas where traditionally it hasn't been an issue, um, it was starting to show up. Uh, growers kind of knew about it, but maybe weren't really familiar with the pest. Um, but this year, particularly some areas north and east of Toronto, um, I don't know about Bruce County specifically or this area, but uh, it was kind of the first year they got hit hard kind of out of the blue. Um, so just to make sure you're familiar with it, uh, how, to, uh, how to manage that pest um, I think just kind of have that on your radar, I guess, would be, would be one thing from this year. Megan? Yeah, I'll just uh, piggyback on Ben a little bit. If you're growing edible beans, you need to watch out for western bean cutworm as well. And uh, if you go to cornpest.ca, we have our trapping network um, up on the website. So you can actually see where there are traps and how many cutworm uh, farmers are trapping around the areas. There are some in Gray and Bruce. I believe, um, but and if you'd like to participate, you can as well. But in dry beans, it's almost trickier than in corn. We don't have really good thresholds for the pest in dry beans. Um, we, yeah, if you trap about 50 moths, you know you're at risk. And uh, if you see some pod feeding, then you know you're at risk, but it's really hard to find uh, pod damage. So um, just make sure you're aware and, and maybe consider putting two traps on your bean field and, and monitoring for that pest. So I'd be happy to take any questions specifically on Western bean cutworm. Yeah, this is uh, for Ben. Uh, I'm from the uh, north end of Wellington County. We have uh, a little bit more heat than the fellows on the Dundalk Plain, but a little bit less heat than just about everybody else. Uh, and <laughs> I was, uh, I wanted, to, I'm interested in trying no-till corn. Some of my neighbors have had good luck with strip-till, uh, and that's working, but uh, being naturally cheap, I don't have a, I have a, a no-till planter, but I don't have a, a strip-teller. 
Uh, do you think with the right combination of um, a fertilizer placement and maybe use of biostrips or uh, cover crops that you could kind of create that environment where no-till corn could work in like a, a, a lower heat unit area? Yeah, so that's a good question, Stuart. And you know, there's a number of factors that go towards increasing your probability of success, I think, um, from some of the research that's been done in the province. So for sure, like you mentioned, fertility, um, having starter fertilizer on the planter is really important in a no-till situation, a lot less forgiveness than maybe you'd have in a conventional tillage situation. So I think that's definitely one important part you'd want to have for sure for um, increasing your probability of success. Other things too, I think another big one uh, from research done at the Alora plots as well as at Richtown is crop rotation has a big influence on no-till success. So depending on the area, crop rotation can almost be a bit of a replacement for tillage. If you have a good crop, ro a good crop rotation, um, the response to tillage is likely a lot less than if you had uh, not a very good crop rotation. So I think fertility placement, like you mentioned, and you know a good crop rotation would be two things for sure to help set you up for that success. And what's a good crop rotation? What yes. Is, what is that? Better? Yeah. So corn, soybeans, and wheat with uh, you know with red clover um, as a as a minimum. Um, the research they've done at some of the plots has shown that you know the difference in yield between conventional tillage and no tillage and a good crop rotation like corn, soybeans, and wheat is a lot less than the difference in say a continuous corn rotation. In my area, uh, a neighbor, he has uh, uh, canola and soybeans together. Has there been any experiments on that? I did have a few plants. I pulled them, but uh, round up <laughs> canola and round up uh, soybeans. Uh, how would that work out? Double cropping. Oh, double cropping. So, s sorry. That, that sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, geez, not not something I'd thought of before. Um, we're we're probably harvesting canola a lot earlier than the soybeans, so I think there'd be some challenge at harvest. But, um, geez, how would you how would you make that work? <laughs> I mean, and we don't have a lot of so you can you can plant canola if you have um, sort of aftermarket discs on the planter and then have sort of intercropping uh, situation, I guess. But um, uh, you know, we, ha we do have growers planting canola, uh, more specifically winter, but uh, it seems to work on wider rows. You, you can make it work, but I, that's a good question. I don't know what that would look like. <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, volunteer canola is one of the reasons that uh, most of Ontario canola production is Liberty Link. <laughs> so highly recommend some Liberty Link if you've got other Roundup Ready crops in the, in the system. Question, question at the back. Yeah, seed treatments, all crops, uh, post neonex. Uh, what uh, what's uh, on the radar? What uh, what do you see that's working? What's not working? And uh, what do you uh, see in the crystal ball that may be coming? Yeah. So Jim, as you know, um, uh, if we lose neonex on the dry beans, that'll be a real challenge for leaf hopper control. And and um, you know, it's not. I think there's like a at least five years we've got uh, before at minimum before we lose, uh, potentially lose neonics, but I think edible beans are gonna be a, a real issue. So um, hopefully, it, it is on the radar of some researchers, hopefully we can generate some uh, some projects and looking at, say, the diamides or, or other, um, other new seed treatments on controlling those dry bean insects, but uh, that's gonna be a real challenge. And, and spraying, um, Spraying such small plants on wide rows, if you have like an early leaf hopper issue, is going to be, uh, it's, it's not ideal. So we'll do what we can to keep that product in place, but um, definitely need some research on, on different products. I don't know that diamides are going to be the right product for those uh, sucking insects, but um, yeah. Any comments on canola without neonics? 
Yeah, so uh, we do have diamides on, um, uh, Lumiderm is available for canola, and we've seen a lot of growers move to Lumiderm on, on at least the bare uh, seed, and really good control of fleabane with that product, so seems to um, last a little, er, did I say fleabane? <laughs> That's not what it does, flea beetle. <laughs> Um, good control of flea beetle with that product and, and especially in moist conditions and maybe a little longer protection. So uh, I think in canola, we're, we're happy with that diamide product and hopefully that will also stay around for a while. Any other takers on the Neonet question? Yeah, so on the corn front, uh, there are companies that are offering the diamide uh, insecticide option as well as uh, an alternative for the Neonics. At the back? Oh, Peter. Hi. Oh, come on. <laughs> so, so I'm getting a little, I don't know, my mind is getting boggled because there are so many new foliar products out there. Man, you know, we have SRN, we have Coron, we have Crop Booster, we have Green with Envy, we have uh, Relief MN, and now we're getting into Last End. And so, so what's your take on foliar fertilizer I have growers who tell me there should be foliar fertilizer every time the sprayer goes across the field because there's going to be a yield boost. And I'm just intrigued of what research you know about or what's your personal experience, what you think about, you know, how do I pick the right one and what's my yield gain likely to be? Is that for everyone, Peter? Absolutely. Okay. Ben. Yeah, I don't, I'd be honest with you, I haven't worked with a lot of them at this point yet, Peter. Like you said, there's a lot of them out there, and it's hard to test every one, but uh, just not familiar enough with all those products and having experience working with them at this point. Uh, if you if you can't make it pay, then I don't think you should be putting it in, right? So um, in uh, in canola, we frequently use boron. Uh, we know that boron's important, uh, more important for canola than for other cereal grains, for instance. But even um, even even boron and canola, we can't see um, repeatable yield increases. So uh, I don't know that you know foliar products. I think we need to do strip trials and, and continued research, but uh, it's hard to see those products pay, I think, unless you, unless you can really document a, a deficiency. I would echo Megan's comments. There has been some work done in cereals as well, um, and sometimes there has been some yield advantages, and other times there has not been. So again, I would encourage you to continued research and do some strip trials on your farm, um, because it has to pay for you to be able to apply that product. Question. Okay, so in each of your respective crops of expertise, what do uh, you think is the next big step in yield advancement? So what, what do you want us to be doing trials on our farm that you want to know more about what you think could be the next big step up? <laughs> um, so that's a good question. So I don't know, how many of you were at SWAC uh, this year? So a few of you. Um, so we actually had a really great uh, real wheat growers panel at SWAC um, with some three pretty progressive growers trying some pretty interesting things. Um, and they're, they're really, really pushing intensive management in wheat. Um, they're, they're treating it like it's a cash crop, like their soybean and their corn crops, um, rather than like the poor cousin. Um, and they're, they're doing those extra, those extra fungicide passes. Um, they're pushing the nitrogen. They're applying higher rates of sulfur. Um, so I think uh, a full... Um, uh, a full package is, is being applied to your, your winter wheat crop. Um, Europe is also doing, they're looking at doing more seed singulation um, and, and more precision, precision ag type, um, so variable rate nitrogen, those sorts of things. So I think those uh, advancements will be the sort of next big thing in, in cereals. Yeah, for canola, I think um, we're maybe not applying enough nitrogen in canola. So um, split N, I think, is something that growers are starting to move to, and we'd like to see more growers putting on nitrogen between four and six leaf. Um, we, I know there's some research being conducted in Ottawa by Balo Ma, so he's, he did some split N applications, and the most economic rate of nitrogen is actually higher under a split uh, N situation. So um, we can maybe push that yield potential a little higher. Now, Extra N doesn't necessarily always pay in canola, but I think splitting it is a, is a good start. Um, 
And in dry beans, uh, I mean, genetics is a real challenge in dry beans. What we need is new varieties. So that work uh, continues to be supported by your growers and, and local research. But um, um, I think uh, an important thing in dry beans, I don't know about increased yield, but I mean, we have root diseases we need to get, uh, get controlled and, and mold, and um, there, there are significant challenges uh, in increasing yield. But uh, we do need to think about, um, uh, I think we need to think about reduced tillage and preserving soil organic matter to, to have uh, sustainable dry bean production into the future. Good soil structure and, and organic matter are important for dry bean production. So. Yeah, Adam, it's nothing new or big, but I think just, uh, you know, continuing to watch fertility as crop yields have increased in the last couple of years, there's been some really big crops in Ontario. Um, some of the work from our fertility trials uh, has just shown the importance of making sure that you saw those basics under control and, and you're watching for those as well. Question at the back. Yeah, in the uh, split in the end on corn, did, have you seen many trials on that, whether it's big advantage or just spend a lot of money for no good reason. Yeah, so are you talking like late, like a conventional side dress application or even the later in crop applications? Oh, like probably an early bump at whatever unit you put on, then like um, oh, six, five feet higher going in with that last dose just at, before tasseling. Right, so yeah, from the, the bit of research that's been done in the province, if there's enough nitrogen in the system, um, if all you're going to do is move a bit of nitrogen to a later stage, there's generally no advantage to that, no yield advantage. Um, but if for whatever reason nitrogen is going to be short for that crop, so the crop yields a lot higher than what you maybe expected, or maybe there's a lot more losses for whatever reason there wasn't enough there, um, it's still absolutely, uh, you can still get a response at those later stages um, in a split application. I think if the only thing you do is just move nitrogen, uh, you shouldn't necessarily expect uh, an increase in yields, but uh, it can be more efficient, and in some years, if it's going to be short, um, having some extra nitrogen later there can provide a benefit. I question got a question on uh, canola. Yes, are you talked about split end on canola. What timing are you kind of aiming for there on the second pass? I guess assuming the first is pre. Yeah, I think uh, right around uh, five leaf, between four and six leaf is when you want to put nitrogen down. So um, we have. I, like, canola has a high end requirement, so three to three and a half pounds per bushel. So, uh, we, I, if you put down, if you get a 50 bushel crop, you probably needed about 150 pounds of N. So, um, like, I'm not necessarily suggesting we need to go that high uh, right off the hop, but um, we definitely need to bump up rates, I think. So, even if you put 100 pounds up front, consider coming back in with some nitrogen. And I don't think the form really matters, just however you can get it on. Question. What was the right rate of nitrogen on corn this year? <laughs> the rate. <laughs> 162.3 pounds. <laughs> no, obviously that's a big uh, a challenging question to answer, but uh, we do do some plots where we put out zero nitrogen plots and, uh, and an enriched plot. And then our zero nitrogen plot will tell us what the background soil is going to provide us. So um, obviously if the soil has good nitrogen supplying capabilities, you should expect a fairly high zero nitrogen yield. If you're on a soil with poor capacity, like a really low organic matter, um, quite often sandy soils, your zero N should be fairly low. Uh, and then we also put N rich plots beside them as well. So we might put 200, 220 pounds out. So in most cases we expect you shouldn't get any more response to yield um, up at those levels. So that difference kind of tells us what the relative responsiveness is to nitrogen. So in our plots this year, um, I think I say zero nitrogen, but we do allow starter amounts, so maybe up to 30 pounds. So our average rate is probably a little under 30 when I say zero. It's not a true zero. Um, but we were around, I think it was about 140 bushels uh, as a zero N yield or starter only yield, which is kind of average, maybe a little bit lower than what we maybe see in some of our past trials. Um, suggesting that maybe things were a little bit lower from a nitrogen supplying capability. Our N rich yields were in the 210 range, average across our, I think, 23 or 24 sites we had. So I think the N response was maybe a little bit more this year than what uh, the same trials have indicated over the last uh, two or three years, if that answers your question. Question back here. 
Yeah, a little similar to uh, Pete's uh, question there about foliars and biologics. Uh, we've used uh, biologics, uh, different trials in liquid fertilizer on soybeans, uh, corn, uh, white beans, and uh, we don't seem to be seeing a lot of uh, big advantage to it. And I guess uh, what we're looking at, uh, just opinion, is that uh, what do you see the future of biologics, or is there something that we should be doing different with them, or thoughts? Yeah, I, I, uh, I haven't worked enough with them to have a feel for that from, from my corn perspective. Uh, we've, I've sort of been involved in some uh, trials with um, like AgTiv or different products that are supposed to increase end fixation in dry beans. And some growers will say that they're pulling off a couple hundred extra pounds uh, with that AgTiv product. But... I don't know that I can say that I've seen that, um, but I think there there could be something to that, particularly with dry beans, is getting them to increase end fixation, and, and maybe there's something in that neighborhood we can look at with biologicals, um, because as we kind of expect dry beans to fix uh, their own nitrogen, but they're really, based on some work that Peter Pauls and his students are doing at Guelph, only fixing between 11 and 55 percent of their nitrogen needs. So, um, so there could be something to those products. But uh, again, yet to be seen, I guess. Yeah, so Monsanto BioEgg has been doing some work in cereals as well with some of the products they have. Um, in some years, they're pulling off an extra 11 bushels uh, in, on some sites. In other years, again, they're not, they're not seeing those advantages. So the challenge we're finding with those is, is the consistency. Um, and so if we don't have that consistency, it's, it's difficult to say, yeah, you should go out and you should be using these products. Um, so it's something that they're still continuing to do more research on. Um, and hopefully we can and get some of that consistency. But um, again, it has to pay. So if, if it doesn't, then it's, it's something you might not want to be using. But I would just add, make sure you know how you're supposed to handle those products, especially if they're living or live like uh, organisms. Because um, we've seen where they're not refrigerated properly and they're just not going to be alive when you put them down. And also, um, sometimes the starter that you put down with, with the products will kill the kill the living um, biological, so make sure you uh, read the, all the instructions. Hey, Ben. Uh, just about the end strip, the, the, the zero strip and, uh, and the high strip, have you used any uh, like analysis, like a 360 soil scan or green seeker or anything like that, or could you, do you have any experience with some of those uh, products uh, this year for, for measuring uh, nitrogen in season? to make better plans for those uh, later applications. Yes, we didn't do any green seeker work. We did, um, we, all the samples we pulled, we pulled so our, um, our conventional PSNT timing, so second week of June. And then we also just want to get a bit of an idea how soil nitrates change over the course of the spring. So we pulled samples at planting timing uh, at the end of May and then also kind of third week of June and then the last week of June as well. Um, we did pull samples and split them in half and also ran them through the soil scan. We haven't run that data yet to, to get a feel for how they match the lab results or what kind of relationship is there uh, yet at this point. But I think in the future, we should have those results out. Any other experience with them this year? No. Soil scan at all? Yeah, not, not at this point that we've crunched yet. Question yeah, so while, while you're on the nitrogen strategy, because all three of you deal with crops that need nitrogen, What's your best shot at how I predict what the right net nitrogen rate is going to be in 2018 for your respective crops? Because 17 doesn't matter to me anymore, right? It's done. Yeah, so certainly from corn as a starting point would be to use the, the corn nitrogen calculator. And, you know, it just gives you an average. You enter in your, uh, your different variables, so your yield goal and prices and that sort of thing, uh, soil type. And it kind of gives you an average of what the, the trials in that database have been based on the information you enter as a best guess. Um, there is some different research going on in terms of uh, what influences things. So obviously there's PSNT testing you could do as well if you have a bit of a feel for if things are low or high for your fields. Uh, some of the research that's been done at Guelph as well as some stuff in Quebec has kind of shown that uh, rainfall timing during the month of June. So kind of before and after side dress timing might have an impact on what the optimum end rate is as well. So if we get above average precipitation in that window, 
Um, you might need to increase rates a little more. If precipitation is below average, um, you could maybe dial things back. But I guess kind of starting from the average, maybe getting a bit of an idea of what your fields are like on a relative level, and then maybe making a, a bit of a seasonal adjustment based on the precipitation. So there are some tools out um, trying to work with that. I don't, I'm not sure they're available at this point, but uh, that's some of the stuff that's being done on the corn front at least. Joanna? Um, so with winter wheat, uh, there are a number of things that we need to take into consideration. So we need to know what the crop rotation, the history of manure, um, as well as when was your planting date. So we need to be careful for, we need to manage log, lodging risk as well as tillering. Um, and what's your, what's your goals for yield? Um, so I take all those things into consideration when trying to determine um, what your nitrogen rates are, as well as whether or not you're going to be using a fungicide. Um, as the trials through the Ontario Sale Crop Committee have shown that, um, and through the research that was previously done uh, by Peter, that when we do add a fungicide, or if we're going to push our nitrogen rates, um, we do need to be including a fungicide um, to see that benefit and see that uh, um, the, the higher merms. Any comments on, we certainly have a high degree of late planted wheat. Would that change the nitrogen strategy? Um, um, yeah, so definitely. So if we're if we have layer planted wheat, um, again we want to we are, are trying to manage our, our tillering um, as well as we're, our lodging risk may not be there similar to as if we had early planted wheat. Um, so you might be able to bump those rates up uh, in those situations. Thanks for your question, Peter. I don't know that I have a great answer. Um, I think price of the fertilizer is a big factor. Like in canola, we don't always have. Uh, it's not the most profitable crop, let's say. Um, so in, it's not always economical to keep uh, putting up end rates, but um, yeah, <laughs> that's about all I got. Well, I'm a grower, come on, what's my end rate? Well, like I said, uh, it is important to have a yield goal in mind, and I think that's an a important part in canola of how we keep pushing forward. So, so have a higher yield goal in mind and try to meet that yield goal. And knowing that you need three to three and a half pounds per bushel, um, we need to start bumping up end rates. But our average yield in Ontario this year was 48 bushels. Uh, so pretty high. A lot of growers really happy with their canola yields. But you need to start getting up to, you know, a lot of, a lot of growers around the 110, uh, um, 110 pounds of N, I think we need to keep bumping that up. So up to up to 120 or do strips on farm, I think is a great idea. Put some strips down of higher N rates up to 125, 140, see what, see what you turn up with. Question? Uh, in light of this morning's presentation regarding uh, soil biology and uh, soil tilth and soil life, um, what areas in our present practices do you see in the country where we're missing the greatest potential to maximize um, uh, gains in uh, biological approaches and which areas of what we're doing do you see the greatest risk of a uh, catastrophe? An environmental or a yield catastrophe? You choose. <laughs> Well, in terms of opportunities, I still think there's lots of opportunities to expand our crop rotations. Um, we, we still are, tend to be in this corn soybean rotation in, in uh, a significant part of the province. And I think having wheat in the rotation uh, has huge benefits in terms of soil health and feeding the soil. Um, it also has uh, huge benefits in terms of yield. The long-term research trials at both uh, Richtown and Alora show that uh, having wheat in the rotation adds an additional 10 bushels to the following corn crop on average, those are our conservative numbers, and five bushels to our soybean crop. And that's all through improvements in soil health. Uh, having wheat in the rotation also has an opportunity for you to apply manure at proper times. We talk about winter spreading and those types of issues, so it's good for manure management, um, but also an opportunity to incorporate cover crops uh, particularly red clover, or if you uh, have struggled with getting a good red clover stance, it's an opportunity to plant a cover crop after winter wheat. So you could throw something in there like oats or radish or anything like that to feed the soil and have a continuous cover um, to feed those biologicals. Yeah, and on the corn side, I think, uh, you know, obviously there's been a drive towards more reduced tillage. Obviously there's some baggage that can come with no tillage. Um, but I guess from the strip tillage perspective, there's been a fair bit of interest in it, maybe some opportunities 
that uh, to get a fair bit, of, fair amount of reduced tillage, but still get some of the benefit of uh, conventional tillage as well. Obviously, again, there's still some learning curves and things that maybe have to get sorted out for from a best management practice perspective. But I think some of the opportunities from you know insurance from a tillage insurance perspective and some fertility options as well with strip tillage um, that could maybe help towards more reduced tillage options. Yeah, so uh, where we might have some missed opportunities with dry beans, so um, it's it's a struggle. Uh, they're, they're kind of a wimpy crop, wimpy root, root system, but um, there is a lot of full tillage, right, uh, in dry beans. So, and there are growers out there in min-till where they're just kind of cultivating in the spring or um, uh, strip-till or even no-till systems with small seeded beans. So I think there's definitely some opportunity to, to work on reduced tillage in dry beans. Uh, of course, that, that will have some challenges. Uh, weed control in particular, um, already a challenge to control beans or sorry weeds in the dry bean crop but uh, so we'll probably see more burn downs and things like that with minimum or no-till but um, another way we can um, approach that uh, so adding organic matter with the cover crop but um, ahead of dry beans cereal rye I think looks kind of interesting we've seen um, so planted in the fall um, I've seen a few fields this year where they had about 50 pounds of cereal rye in the fall and then burn it off in May before planting dry beans and really good weed control in those situations. So adding that organic matter, helping with weed control and then going into a no-till situation, um, it looked pretty good. So uh, still could be some yield challenges in no-till and you still kind of need to roll the field and have a, have a uh, plant with good architecture like an upright plant that you can clip. Um, but. I, I think there's some opportunities to reduce tillage in beans. Question here? Um, sort of a good segue into my question. So for all three of you, for all of your respective crops, uh, we've talked about sort of a minimum crop rotation. What's your absolute ideal crop rotation? And I'll throw another caveat in there. You can include cover crops, you can include manure, whether it's chicken manure, pig manure, whatever it might be. So what's maybe either the most successful or what's your favorite? Um, crop rotation is and include all the practices you would include. Yeah, so certainly again, just going off the research that's been done at Guelph and uh, Ridgetown, um, you know, a corn, soybean, and wheat rotation with red clover and that uh, added as well shows benefits across the entire rotation. So I think, um, you know, I don't know the, the best rotation, but from a general cropping system, anyways. Uh, relative to a shorter rotation, um, sure has benefits across the entire rotation on, and all, all the crops in that rotation. He didn't mention canola. <laughs> I would agree with Ben, corn, soybean, wheat, red clover. Um, the other thing with the long-term research trials is with the clover, um, in the corn plots the following year, we applied uh, adequate amounts of N, so it was non-limiting rates of N. Um, and with that red clover in there, we're getting on top of the 10 bushels, we're getting another average of nine bushels per acre, just again for improved soil health. So um, I still say red clover is still one of the best covers to include in your rotation if you can get a good even stand, which I realize is still one of the biggest challenges, um, but there is research going on at the University of Guelph that is looking at developing varieties that are specific for underseeding in winter wheat because Historically, our clover has been developed to be grown on its on its own. So, um, I'd still say corn, soybeans, wheat, red clover is the best, in my opinion. She also didn't mention canola. <laughs> yeah, canola. I guess not everybody's going to grow canola, but um, there are some important things. I guess with both uh, dry beans and canola, we really like winter wheat following those crops. Right, we get off to an early start with the winter wheat and both of those after both uh, dry beans and canola. So um, really good yields. Um, of course, with um, dry beans, we often go after corn because uh, mostly for a, a herbicide perspective or weed control perspective, we had good weed control coming off a of corn crop. So um, probably don't want to see soybeans in rotation with dry beans if possible. Uh, just from a disease perspective, uh, that, that could cause some disease carryover. Um, in canola, uh, so you don't want corn after your canola because um, there can be some uh, phosphorus issues. Uh, canola doesn't host the mycorrhizal fungi that help 
uh, corn take up phosphorus. So we don't uh, we don't want to see corn after canola. But um, uh, some some people are kind of using five crops, right? Uh, like a spring wheat, and then canola, and then and then wheat again, and then um, uh, like corn and soy. Um, and we, I've looked at research. Um, soybeans before or after canola or with a cereal crop in between doesn't seem to matter yield wise and uh, doesn't always matter disease wise um, it's it's fairly safe I guess but there could be some disease carryover between soy and canola so and sorry I want to add one more thing um, so I did say corn soybeans wheat but uh, one thing to that's really important um, is to make sure that we're getting our soybean crop off in time so we're trying to push our soybeans um, and have longer season beans, but I would try to to plant a shorter season bean so that we can get those beans off early and get the winter wheat planted early because um, that's your best bet for big yields. Yeah, just one more thing to add to that as well. Um, from some numbers that Bill, uh, Bill Dean's crunched at the Laura Research Station has shown that even if you get into a year with stress, stressful situation, like a really dry year, um, a good crop rotation helps support you in those years so it doesn't fall apart nearly as much as poor rotation does when you get in those stressful years. So maybe one more thing, almost an insurance policy of having a more complex rotation. And again, we just said corn, soybeans, and wheat because those are the rotations that they've done at those stations. So I don't know if just a general, more complex rotation, but uh, that's just why we're coming from that approach as well, I think. No real takers on the favorite manure part of the question. No. <laughs> well, um, you got a comment on that? Well, I just, canola is a good crop, um, like a nitrogen-loving crop. <laughs> I do what I can. <laughs> um, but, yeah, manure is great in both in, uh, in a canola system. So, um, yeah, I guess, I don't know, a lot of our best uh, canola crops come off a of dairy farm. So, um. And manure after winter wheat is also a good opportunity. <laughs> Question at the back. Everybody's trying to get the last word in, eh? Um, so this is a strip-till question, I guess, geared towards edibles and corn. Strip-till seems to be the holy grail everybody's talking about, um, and there's lots of obvious environmental benefits, but those don't always make your payments, right? Um, so just in your mind, uh, strip-till, uh, some of the progressive growers you know, what are some of the things they're doing in that system to increase their revenue per acre or decrease their costs that are going to help them pay for that investment. Yeah, I guess fertility management would be one, um, making sure you're set up. So some of the research that, uh, that we've played around with at OMAFRA, including when Greg was corn specialist, uh, showed that you know, in a lot of trials you could get away with just fertility on the strip tiller but um, still having some on the planter in some cases still provided a response above what was just on the strip tiller. Um, in, uh, in other cases as well, I think from a management perspective is uh, making sure that there is uh, you know, decent mixing in that zone as well, that you're not making hot spots that could increase risk for burn. Uh, and as well, that you're not putting all the fertility deep down um, like in a, with a, just a shank type application that could be five or six inches below. Um, from some of the work that Greg had done, um, from that perspective, it, it was almost as if you had hidden that, uh, that starter fertilizer. Um, yields weren't all that different than where you didn't apply fertilizer. So I guess from some of the management practices like fertility, um, keeping some of those things in mind to help make that system work. Yeah, thanks for your question, Blair. Um, I don't know that I have an answer on dry beans of how you can make more money strip tilling. Um, certainly use a lot of fuel in a full plow situation, so I guess that's a savings. But I have been uh, sort of following along some dry bean growers on, on strip till, and they're having reasonable success. And, and again, they're planting cereal rye ahead of, uh, ahead of the beans. So again, not sure about a cost savings, but better weed control and, and um, yeah, I don't know how you pay for that strip tiller, sorry. Okay, I think we're just gonna wrap up here now. We're getting pretty close on time. Um, maybe just to wind things up, what would be one strategy you'd wanna see growers bring into 2008, 18? One, one plan that they should have in their toolbox for 2018. Well, it's a good opportunity for me to um, try to uh, provide some awareness about club root and canola. So we have club root across the province, basically, or all canola growing regions, and you have club root here. Um, so uh, 
know that and, and manage for it. Um, uh, try some new varieties. And we're also lost one of our favorite canola varieties, right? So I think it's really valuable to put some strip trials on your farm uh, with different canola varieties. Try out some of those club root uh, resistant varieties and move to those varieties early. Uh, you don't want to be in a situation where you're, you've lost yield to club root. And also when you, when you are in that situation, you've drastically increased the amount of club root in the soil. So, so uh, variety uh, trials on, on canola are going to be valuable for you. Yeah, and I guess with um, you know with the high yields that we've had the last couple of years, just making sure you're on top of fertility and uh, doing soil testing and make sure you know where you're sitting from that perspective. Uh, and then I guess just wrapping up from where we started as well, um, you know, make sure you're scouting and watching for new pests like western bean cutworm, or make sure those things are on your radar if uh, if they haven't been issues in the past. So there are a lot of things I would like to see growers do. Um, but I would say for, for winter wheat in particular is, is get out and walk your fields and know exactly what's going on. Um, again, historically, we tend to plant our wheat, toss on some nitrogen, walk away, come back and harvest it. But I think we need to get out and know exactly what's going on. Um, and we need to be proactive with our, our disease management, particularly with diseases like stripe rust. Um, if that disease comes in early, again, um, it moves very quickly and, and from infection, uh, from when it first uh, comes into infection to reproduction can be 10 days. So that disease can move very quickly and we're having to be reactive. So um, I think getting out, scouting and being proactive on our disease management um, is something I would like to see happen. I guess I should touch on dry beans as well. Uh, so SCN is a problem, soybean cyst nematode is something that we're recognizing is an issue in dry beans as well. So I don't know how much SCN you have up in this area, but uh, black beans are uh, not so susceptible, but kidneys and, uh, and adzukis for sure are really susceptible to SCN. So just uh, do an SCN test, just when you take your soil sample for fertility, take, split that sample and send it in for an SCN test. Um, also, Western Bean Cutworm, access all the information you can on cutworm and dry beans and contact me and look on our uh, website, fieldcropnews.com, for information on that. Um, and there was something else. Oh, and, and I would say uh, your Ontario bean growers, um, you know, do fund research and we'd like to know what your research priorities are. So I think it'd be good to feed up some of that information. What are your challenges in dry beans and what can your growers help you address? So I'd, I'd be interested in hearing about research priorities on dry beans. Thanks. Awesome. So that's our panel today, folks. Let's give these guys a round of applause.